Hello and welcome to the World Music Podcast. This is your host, Will Marsh. Thank you for joining me on episode one, where I'm sharing with you my interview with musician Jai Utal. Now, Jai is really a pioneer in the world music community. He has brought the ancient style of kirtan from India and infused that with his own deep sense of melody and composition. In 1991, Jai released his debut album, Footprints, which featured the world music innovator Don Cherry and the Indian vocalist Lakshmi Shankar. The album received critical acclaim and led Jai and his band, the Pagan Love Orchestra, to international prominence. Jai's music brings together so many influences ranging from the hillbilly music of the Appalachian Mountains to Hindustani classical music. Um, He studied closely with the great maestro Ali Akbar Khan. And as someone who has had the opportunity to see Jai perform many times, he really excels as a performer, bringing out the spirit of devotion and improvisation um, and sharing the joy that is spread through, through music and kirtan especially. In this interview, Jai really authentically reflects on his journey as a musician, a seeker, a devotee, and there's just a lot of great stories and insights covered. So even if you're not familiar with Jai and his music, I know that you will uh, really reap the benefits of, of the wisdom uncovered in this interview, which was originally recorded December 10th, 2020. Enjoy. Well, here we are. Thanks for joining us. I'm, I'm so excited today to have Jai Utal as my guest. And uh, Jai's music has been a big inspiration on my path. He was the first Kirtan artist I ever heard. And um, just somebody I look up to for his ability to bring um, Indian classical and devotional music and just putting out so much music in that, in that genre here. And yeah, welcome, Jai. Thank you. Uh, I'm so happy be here with you. Thank you. Well, you know, um, I love to begin by just hearing what some of your earliest musical memories are and, and where that kind of sparked for you, you know, as a young person. And for some of us, it was a part of our household or family. And, and uh, I think everyone has a unique story of, of their early musical uh, memories. Well, um, my first memory is that it, my father was in the music business mm. and he was, he, he was a musician, but, but he was a little bit of a frustrated musician. And so he put his music playing aside and, and became um, a businessman in the music business. And, and he had a, a long string of record companies. He had some periods of great success and he, you know, had finally went bankrupt and had periods of, Financial ruin, I guess we could say. Um, but when I was young, like, if I can think right, like 9, 10, 11, something like that, every week my dad would bring home the top 20 singles uh, from the radio stations and sit with me and my sister. My sister is a year and a half older. And just like pick our brains for what we thought about each of these singles. Wow. Uh, then I was really cool. And, um, you know, I was quite young. I didn't, I, I don't remember what I said or, but, but just the fact, first of all, it was a beautiful bonding experience with my father, um, which I would say we didn't have many of those through life, but, but that was something special. And, and he really wanted to know what the young ear heard. Hmm. So that was really cool. My my first, I would say, musical just love when I was around eleven, I think. A friend of mine played five string banjo, and he and he played it for me, and I fell in love with the banjo, and uh, became obsessive. You know, I just became obsessed with it, and I was also a very alienated kid. I didn't ha- I didn't have friends much, and my home scene was emotionally very tense. Let's put it that way. And and somehow the banjo I, I don't exactly know why, but just playing the strings of that instrument uh, 
gave me a sense of sanctuary. I, I had studied piano since I was six. I, I never would say I got particularly good at piano, although I'm thankful because it gave me a, a good foundation of music theory. Mm-hmm. Um, but the love came with the banjo and, and my uh, field of passion in the banjo is it's what's called old timey music. It's um, the music that came before bluegrass. So it's like not fancy, it can be technical, but it's not that mathematical thing of bluegrass banjo, which I, I, I should say I love, but I, I never uh, got into it very much. So it's, you know, the mountain music of Appalachia and um, the Ozarks and, all, you know, it's very rustic music. And, and the singing of these musicians, uh, there's a couple that were particularly moving to me, just just uh, connected me with that inner hunger, or uh, I don't know how I worded it at that at the time, but I certainly felt it that inner longing for some deep connection. Hmm. Were you singing as well these kind of traditional songs with the banjo? Very little. I I, I actually was so insecure about singing that I, I sang some. But I didn't really embrace singing till till my forties. But um, you know, one thing that, that I, I should add: when I, I started studying Indian classical music with Ali Akbar Khan when I was nineteen, hmm. and um, Ali Akbar Khan would not teach us instrumental music unless we also studied vocal music. Um, there was a there was a vocal teacher at the time, an Indian woman was part of the school and you know none of none of in 19 was it 1970 or gosh i don't remember the, remember but most of the guys in the in the class nobody wanted to sing it was just like no we wanted to <laughs> the sirota was just so powerful and masculine and just like you know the that's what we wanted, and, and singing requires or creates, maybe is a better word, so much vulnerability. Yeah. Later, I began to understand that playing uh, instruments also does. But at that moment in my life, I wasn't really connecting to it in that way. So, so, so it was Kansab that got me singing. Wow. Again, I didn't fully embrace it till later, but... If I hadn't, if concept didn't have that rule, and it was an absolute rule, you know, it was like, I won't teach you unless you do this. Um, if you didn't have that rule, I don't know if I would have ever really gotten into singing. Um, I know I'm completely jumping ahead from mm. the question. That, no, that's, I think that's a really awesome bit there that, you know, it wasn't necessarily like, you felt this um, freedom to be devotional and expressive with your voice so easily. It came over time, and Kansab kind of, just as a musical pedagogy, um, you know, I'm familiar with that too. I you know, learn all these sargams, and that is a requirement for um, the study of raga. And I think it's beautiful how that kind of brought out this this freedom for your voice and you know, kind of forced you to, to be like, all right, well, if I want to play road, I got to do some singing. And, um, I'm glad, I'm glad that that happened. I, I'm so glad that I, <laughs> I remember particularly one time, you know, when I would practice the singing, uh, the compositions that we were learning in the class, I had to make sure that no roommates were in my house, hmm. you know, a shared house with a bunch of students and I even had to look out the window and see that the neighbor's car was not there wow <laughs> I was so shy and but I remember one time practicing Puriya Dhanashri mm. and um, this beautiful song that, that we were learning and oh my god it, it, it was probably the first time in my life that I felt in expressing music and working on music, uh, this this wholeness in my heart, you know. Hmm. I guess I guess I, w- I was nineteen, eighteen. I you know my chronology 
uh, memory is so bad. But, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, all is said and done, Al Akbar Khan transformed my life. Hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really cool thing how, you know, it, it wasn't the, the simple call and response of devotional kirtan. It was the rather complex raga music that even that still you were, you know, shy to have people hear you. But um, I think that's a really cool story that a lot of people probably wouldn't expect. Um, you know, Purya Dhanashri, Marva, these are difficult scales to sing. And uh, this is, you know, what brought your voice out. So, um, again, I, I think that's a really fascinating and fun bit to, uh, to, to share. And, and backtracking, uh, I have to say that I still, still, still love the banjo. And um, since the pandemic started, I, I actually have dived. Dived? Is that the word? I mean, I've like dived deeply once again into, into banjo. And, you know, I'm taking an online course and um, my skills are still, you know, this is like what, what, 50 years of barely playing it. So my skills are still, <laughs> you know, rough. Uh, but I've been writing a lot of kirtan songs accompanied by the banjo. And, and it's fun, man. Yeah. Is that something um, we may hear in an upcoming album or release, or is this something that you're just kind of doing as your own practice? Well, I don't know any more about albums and releases. <laughs> <laughs> That's another discussion, which we can get to, but, but I have been singing them, you know, since March, since the second week of March, I've been doing live stream concerts every Friday Almost every Friday, you know, so we taken some weeks breaks, and you know, so I wouldn't say it's been, but it's but that's a lot of concerts, you know, and they're concerts slash kirtans. So some of it is me performing songs, and some of it is call and response kirtans. Um, but so anyway, I've shared a lot of these these banjo kirtan songs. Um, awesome. I don't know if I just don't know about recording right now. Yeah, I, I feel you, and that's another topic. Um, well, I'm going to backtrack a little. We got a little bit of your background. You know, your father, um, that's just so kind of sweet, the way that he, like, I can see the business side of it, too. It's like he wanted to know what, what young people thought of um, popular music, and it's brilliant, like, to a way to connect and foster that um, connection to music and then kind of finding the banjo, and eventually you made it out um, to Marin where you studied with Kansab. Now, kind of as this was happening, was there something inside of you that kind of knew like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a musician. Um, were you expected to kind of have another role in life when you were talking about career and identity or were you maybe clear that I'm, I'm going to be a musician and, and follow this as a career path? Well, remember that this was, you know, I, I moved to California in 1969 and prior to that I I was living in Oregon for a little while I I, I went to Reed College but I dropped out after one semester having failed music and religion and um, you know I love saying that it's true you know it's so ironic at any rate you know this was full full into the hippie you know I was a, if you could, you know, I'll just say it, I was kind of like a flower power spirit loving hippie, but as opposed to like a motorcycle driving, hard drinking hippie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thoughts of career was the farthest thing from my mind. Mm. Um, that being said, I always knew that I wanted to be a musician. I didn't think of it as necessarily a business a way to support myself. I just didn't, uh, you could say I was completely um, unrealistic, but that wasn't really that. I just, I wasn't connected to the mainstream world. I was just in another, my community of friends and stuff. We were, we were dreamers, you know, Mm. but I did know. And I, I actually saw myself when I saw, when I would look into the future, you know, I saw myself as, as, not as a singer again. I wasn't really embracing singing, but as a, as a, as a like a musician yogi who lived on a mountaintop and played 
healing music that people would come and, and listen to. Hmm. So it's kind of funny, you know, uh, that that image I had of myself as a, as a teenager, well, it's not exactly what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm not on a mountain and I'm not a healer and I live with a family and I got a 15 year old kid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the essence of that, of that dream of who I would become is what happened. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't clear. You know, my, my parents also really discouraged me. Um, they, they encouraged me to study music and learn music. And that was beautiful. That was a gift. But they, my father, you know, said, why don't you join me in the business? You know, and they, what they were saying had, had truth, you know, cause there's just so the music, being a musician, there's so much competition, and they just said you got to be a really unique person to make it. But the thing was, like, I didn't think about making it. I didn't even mm. know what making it meant. I didn't. I didn't care about making it. I just, you know, at the time, uh, I just knew that I had to play music. Uh, if I didn't, I would die. And. You know, I'm 69 now, and and it's about the same. It's about the same. I have I have financial concerns now, and we work in you know in that world now, and so you know different things have evolved, but still, essentially, it's it's like you know, play music and sing, write music, play music, sing, or else we're gonna die. Um. So yeah. I've kind of been me for a long time. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's the goal for all of us to just have that trust and clarity of it can be anything, but that's more than anything that our mind can conceive. It's coming from, you know, a deeper place. And I think we see the power of that. You know, you, you were free spirit, you know, with the, with the hippies and you had a vision of, of what your soul knew it was here to do. And yeah, like you said, it's not exactly the same, but the essence is very much the same. So um, I like to affirm that with listeners and people who are maybe on an artistic path or, you know, we all have to quote unquote, make it to some extent, you know, we have to live in the material world, but I think it's powerful hearing, you know, someone like, like you who is, who has spent a life creating music, just sharing that, you know, I've just been following what I know to be true. Um, a lot of depth to that. And I've, um, you know, talking about your family and your parents, did you grow up with a strong kind of religious identity or family dynamic? Well, well, my parents, um, I mean, I, as, as much as my life revolves around Hindu devotional practices, you know, if someone asks me, I, I, I consider myself Jewish mm. and I feel very connected to the ancient tribal aspect of Judaism, mm. but, but I'm not, I'm not at all connected to any synagogue or any, you know, uh, a, a strong Jewish religious practitioner would call me a, like a, a a lapsed, failed Jew or something like that. Or my friend called me Jew-ish, like with a, a dash between Jew and ish. <laughs> but my parents, you know, we went to synagogue. They weren't, they weren't religious. They were, it was, it was more like, um, socially Jewish. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Um, Identity. It's like a, yeah. It's like, yeah. this is where we come from and we do some of the outward things to, show this, but it's not like a deep, um, engaged practice. And, and I wouldn't say that they were spiritual people. Um, I was bar mitzvahed, uh, you know, all that, but, but the family dynamic was a very, very difficult one. And, you know, let's just skip over it. Uh, I, I share it. I've shared my family, my childhood family dynamic. It's not like a secret, but I, I'll just say that it was really difficult with alcoholism and other stuff. And, and yet, my parents gave me music, you know, and my, my mother was an artist, a painter. 
So our, our house, our family was very artistic. So despite all the other um, <laughs> sorrowful things, um, it was an artistic family. You know, I mean, when I was young, my father actually brought me to a recording session. Uh, you're younger. You might not know. Have you ever heard of Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels? I haven't. He, he was he was one of the, the great rockers. Um, and uh, he had a couple of super hit records, Good Golly, Miss Molly. They were actually, um, they were big hit songs and they were really raw, rough. I, I know that song, Good Golly, Miss Molly. I'm familiar with the songs, yeah. Okay, and Devil with a Blue Dress on. Um, anyway, I was at those recording sessions. I was a little kid, and, and, and you know, that was just, like, mind-blowing. So even though it's not the musical direction I went in, it, it, it added to this, like, wow. Yeah. Where is that? <laughs> so I, re- I really, you know, despite everything, I, I, I have so much gratitude to my parents for um, uh, planting that seed in me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, that question really came, my friend who I'm recording with here is Jewish. And like many of us, his path has embraced just a lot of different worldviews and inspirations. And, you know, I think it's powerful for other people to hear that it's like, maybe on the outward side or like what a Jew is supposed to be, you wouldn't quite fit in, but in your heart and in your identity, you still connect with that ancient tradition. And I think that's something valuable for people to hear. It's like, you don't have to be um, the Jew that your parents want you to be, or that your you know rabbi wants you to be, but it's, if that personal kind of spark is there, there's something to that, you know, you're not distancing yourself or trying to step away from your roots. You're actually having a broader life experience and then still coming back to something that is ancient. And so that, that's something that I, I really like that we got out of that bit there. And, um, yeah, it's good for people to hear that. I think it was, um, probably around 25 years ago, uh, I was invited to sing at a festival in, in Israel. Uh, I had made friends with an, an Israeli kind of spirit rock group. I don't know, world music group. Let's put it that way. A, a very, very spiritual world music group. And they were, at first they were fans of mine and they had come to, they live in Israel, but they had come to America a couple of times. And, and the fan relationship very quickly turned into a very good friend relationship. And a couple of the guys, well, particularly one is now so many years later, one of my very, very, very best friends. Mm. But um, a- anyway, so uh, I went to Israel. It was a festival of uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace, which at the time was was a dangerous statement. I guess even still is a dangerous statement. Mm. Uh, but I I found there, you know, this this whole culture of of very devout Jewish Indiaphiles, you know, because. Because Israel is quite close to India, and and almost all the people that I met, you know, after they got out of the army, because they all have to go in the army, I think at 18, is that what it is? They all, as soon as they did their trip in the army, they went to India. And some of them had studied music, were really accomplished. And one guy was a beautiful sitar player, and also a electric guitarist. But anyway, that trip... Uh, was so moving to me. And so, uh, well, you know, I was in tears almost the whole time. First of all, the, the, the people, this little community that, that invited me and raised me and took me in were like the coolest people. They, they lived like ancient yogi, mystic. Not really. They had houses, they had cars, and they had kids. So not that. But they spent most of their time, you know, going to this stream or under this tree and just spending the day singing and playing music and um you know a lifestyle that i had gotten far away from Mm. and i i felt like i had connected with my tribe and then a really crazy thing happened i at the concert um at the festival i sang my uh, a song from my album beggars and saints 
which is a, and the song is to, to Lord Shiva. And it starts with this very, I won't say alap because it's not exactly an alap, but it's a, a very intense uh, upper octave prayer sung in the raga style. And I'd sung it, you know, I'd sung it so many times. So, um, well, first of all, the amazing thing was that the whole audience knew my songs. Hmm. And there was, you know, thousands of people there. And, and, and that was just crazy. And then, but then afterwards, a woman came up to me who was also a performer, a singer. And she said, Jai, I got to tell you something. And you, you might think I'm going to, you you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I have to share this with you. We listen to that song. And we hear it in Hebrew. We hear that uh, your your grammar is bad, um, but um, we're, we're Kabbalists, and so the, in Kabbalah, the you know the each syllable and e- each letter is 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 studied and, and has many different components to it. So she said, we hear your song as saying, before creation, the great mother lay in the void. And she, and she was lonely, so she rolled over, and out of her belly came forth creation. And you know that's not what the words mean in Sanskrit, but I you know I was like wow. blown away at the you know that Sanskrit and Hebrew are are both ancient 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 languages and. To, see, to, to just have this realization or this feeling that in ancient times, these cultures were not separated. They were, they were so connected. And, and, that, and, and, and then she said, I said, well, do other people hear that or is it just you? Because I, I, I was, you know, of course, pretty skeptical and <laughs> I don't know the nutcase, right? And she said, no, all of my friends who study Kabbalah or is it Kabbalah? I'm actually not even sure how you say it. But we all have heard that. And that was one of the reasons that we fell in love with your music. And so that's like, that's wild, don't you think? Wow, that is, yeah, it's almost eerily deep. It's just like, yeah, that connection, that ability. I mean, if they're hearing what is intended in one language, that theoretically they could hear any old slew of words but what they're hearing is so connected to um something timeless a timeless idea of you know creation and sound and its role and the divine mother and i mean it's almost unbelievable you know it's wild yeah very very wild like when she told me this like it chills my whole body um wow something else yeah that's that's very deep. I went to Israel subsequently a whole bunch of times, and after that first trip, my friends took me to this to this town called Svat, which is in the mountains in, in Israel, and and it's the center of Kabbalah, and it was kind of the birthplace of Kabbalah. And you know, we went to the sacred baths, and um, it was it was a very very powerful day. And then we were walking back and to the car and there was a bunch of little roadside sh- shops, not shops, stands kind of mm. selling um, trinkets and things. And I, I saw this little medallion and it had um, uh, Hebrew lettering on it. And I asked my buddy what, what that was. And he said, it's the ancient priestly blessing uh, from the time of um, David, King David. And, and uh, it's, it's from when the, the priests would, once a year, the priests would would stand on the parapets, I guess you could say, of the of the temple, and and say this prayer. And it was almost like Reiki that God healing energy would come through their hands, and it was super meaningful for me. So I so I put it to music, and it's on my album Mandorama. The song is called Shalom, and and it's still one of my favorites of my songs. Beautiful. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I I want to talk about some of your music specifically now. And my favorite album of yours is Monkey. And, you know, like you worked with Don Cherry, who is just such a pioneer in, you know, what we can call world music. Don Cherry was on Footprints, not Monkey. 
Okay, he played on footprints and not on monkey, but he inf- he he influenced and and was a mentor and teacher. So I'm assuming you know his influence is is heard on monkey, even though he's not playing on it. His influence, I I still feel it. Yeah. Wow. So how did how did your kind of meeting with with Don Sherry come about, and how did that relationship um, spark? Well, um, I was playing in another band. I was playing electric guitar in a band called Peter Affelbaum's Hieroglyphic Ensemble. Now, Peter is one of the geniuses that I know in my life, and and he lives in New York, and we're still very close friends. Mm. And he also played saxophone and keyboards and drums on many of my albums. It, uh, up until my most recent, Roots Rock Rama, he did all the horn parts. Wow. They were good musical friends. And he, he had a band called the Hieroglyphics Ensemble, and it was, it was uh, a big band, you know, a full horn section, three electric guitars, two drummers, and it was world music slash jazz. You know, um, a lot of African influences and He's a brilliant, he is a brilliant, brilliant musician. Anyway, so he met Don Cherry at a jazz festival. And so and he invited Don to play on one of his albums. I don't remember which one it was, one of Peter's albums. And so Don came to rehearsal a bunch of times and we stuck up a conversation and realized that we had both studied Indian music with the same teacher. Um Z.M. Dagar from the Dagar Brothers family. Wow. Zia Mohadeen Dagar, the Veena player. Wow. Yeah. And who I studied with for quite a, quite a long time. And, and, and um, Don had studied with him. And so suddenly we had like a lot in common. And uh, Don was living in San Francisco at the time. Um, and Peter and I would go over to his house a lot and just hang out. And Don was a, uh, He's a beautiful human being. Mm. He's also a very troubled human being. You know, he struggled on and off with heroin addiction his whole life. You know, he, he had times when he was clean and times when he wasn't, but he never really got into the into recovery and, and sad. But that didn't change the fact that he was almost compassionate and curious, you know, like always wanting to learn something new and he digested and share it with us with his musical younger friends you know yeah and don played on my first album and and well it was both don cherry and lakshmi shankar sang on my first album Mm -hmm. and i think that my quote career unquote which when i made that album i didn't ever even think about a career i just was thinking like oh you make an album (laughs) you know and i got a little backing and um I thought no one would ever listen to it. I had no I, I, even idea that anybody but my close friends would listen to it. But anyway, having Don Cherry on it, and then on the Indian classical side, having Lakshmi Shankar on it, basically put me on the map. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's because of them. And and Don, oh, he played so beautifully. And, and what can I say? You know, Don's playing was affected by his drug addiction and and he had lost his um, front teeth really because of the addiction and he had implants but trumpet there's so much um, pressure there so there was times that he really couldn't play and and there was times that he played beautifully uh, but he was a complete mystic you know he was actually a Buddhist and his his teacher was Kalu Rinpoche and and he was a practicing Buddhist and um, you know so for me you know having my own history and struggles with addiction. You know, people think, oh, a drug addict. Okay, it's fucked up. Well, that is true for some, of course. And same likewise, oh, he's not a drug addict. He's fucked up. You know, people are people. There's very many different kinds of people. But Don was a deeply spiritual, deeply compassionate, deeply inspired, you know. And as I said before, always curious, which was so cool, curious about everything. Yeah. And he was struggled with drug addiction. Um, so he told me that after we recorded Footprints, he told me like several months later, he said that that was his last last recording he ever did. And he was so happy to have done it with me. Mm. And um, I mean, on the positive side, how, how beautiful it was that he 
I didn't have much money. I paid him something, but it was certainly not sort of was quite famous, you know? Yeah. Not what he was used to or what he deserved, but he felt really honored to play it on it with me, and I felt incredibly honored that he played on it with me. And then the point inside being that because of his teeth, really mostly had to stop playing after that. So it was kind of his last recording. And he still performed, but he did stuff like, you know, he played keyboard, he sang, he played percussion. It was really like uh, his concerts. I did a couple with him. It was um, Stream of Consciousness. But uh, he played melodica, um, but hardly any trumpet because because of his condition. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's some great reflections on a, a great musician and a great person. And, you know, that's coming from the, the days of the Pagan Love Orchestra. You know, I wasn't really able to see you in action with that group. I was just a kid in, in Michigan at that time. Um, so I wanted to just ask a few questions about, you know, the height of the Pagan Love Orchestra. Like, you know, where were you guys playing and, and what kind of audience because I guess you're trying to get like into the jazz world. And I'm just curious what that, you know, stage of your career was like, that group. I loved that band so much. Um, I never thought of myself as a jazz musician, but many of the people in the group were jazz musicians. And I, I felt that I was surrounded by musicians who were far more um, knowledgeable and uh, proficient and brilliant. <laughs> than I was and and I felt so lucky that they were excited and wanted to play with me mm. you know our audiences you know we went from everything to from from playing to bar in bars and nightclubs uh to playing festivals and you know special events at art museums and our Montreux Jazz Festival we played at mm. which was a really amazing trip and then we played at this incredible festival in um, Rio de Janeiro we never, never made enough money really to keep it going, but we sort of kept it going. Then, you know, I also, when I look back at myself, I, I, I was very ambitious at the time. I really thought, well, this band is so cool. Let's, you know, also we got a lot of amazing views. And, and you know, it was the beginning of the whole world music movement. Yeah. There wasn't much anything happening like that. I, I, won't, I, I won't say nothing because there were some world music future bands that draw drew from African music and jazz, but from drawing from an Indian well. I, aside from the Beatles, there really wasn't anything. And um, you know, the, the bizarre thing is that when I put Footprints out, I, I was completely shocked. It was noticed and became popular and and all over the world, but great reviews and stuff. So that kind of, but but then I also look back and I realized that I was very controlling. I, I I don't think I made life happy, particularly for my other musicians. They, well, they were happy. We were a good band of happy <laughs> musicians. But but in a sense, you know, my vision was very fixed, and and so I was very uh, strict about telling everybody what they should play. I. In retrospect, I, I, and that changed. I'm not. I'm so not that way anymore. But, but in retrospect, I, I think we could have even been a thousand times better. Because in a way, I was limiting limiting uh, the creativity of each of the musicians, and they were all so great. Mm. Still, in all, I, I, I'm very, very proud of of what we did. And and then we recorded Shiva Station, which is probably the most successful of any of my albums and ever. We had a tour planned, uh, and it was all booked. Everything was booked. It was completely solid. The U.S. tour, you know, and and uh, the record company at the very last minute bailed on the tour. Well, first of all, I was really embarrassed for my musicians. I felt like I had to put it down. I was also really angry. I was also drinking a lot at the time. So you know, uh, one of the <laughs> one of the trademarks of an alcoholic is is blaming other people for your misery. <laughs> but I was very disappointed, and and at that point, so that kind of the band, we kind of disbanded. But there was no bad vibes amongst musicians. We were all friends. 
uh, one or two of them I'm a little out of touch with, but 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 mostly we're all connected. They they have played on almost all of my albums, and it wasn't like the band broke up because they didn't stand each other or anything. They loved each other. We still, still do. We're good friends. Yeah. Um, but the 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 disappointment and the financial kind of like inability to make it work, I, I just felt like I was beating my head against the wall. So I, I sadly let it go. You know, we did a concert last year. We we all got back together. There was a couple of different people, but most of the same people. Twenty twenty doesn't count. Uh, it was two years ago <laughs> in Berkeley at a, at a uh, really nice venue, Freight and Salvage. Oh yeah. And you know, we didn't have any rehearsal. We had we had like separate sectional rehearsals, but there was no way that we could all get together at the same time because also because people were coming from different parts of the country. Yeah. So so the, the performance was definitely shaky, but we had such a good time and the vibe was so great and the audience was so happy. It was sold out and you know just to say that we're still very connected and it's never like I never feel like okay. Pagan Love Orchestra is done and done. I always feel like it's like way in the back burner and you never know when the situation might come where we can regroup. Hmm. Everybody feels that way about it. Everyone's got their own rich careers. But um, anyway, so then when that happened, you know, I was really depressed. And um, But then out of the blue, I started getting all these requests from, from small places to come and, and lead and teach Kirtan. And up until that time, you know, I was, uh, Kirtan was my practice, my home. This is what I did, you know. But it wasn't often that I did it in public. I, a little here and there, but not, you know, it was just my private thing. And then, you know, the cliche, when one door closed, one door is open, another door opens. And so it's kind of what happened. And so I moved into it very tentatively. First of all, you know, like with the pagans, I was singing, but I had, I had so much support, you know. Mm-hmm. The voice was one of the lead instruments, but it wasn't the only lead instrument. It was like the attention was on everyone. It was just such a band rather than a, like a, a soloist with a band supporting him. We, we were really a band. And suddenly the leading kirtans, well, it was scary for me. I, and I also didn't want to assume any kind of mantle of being a spiritual teacher. I just like it was abhorrent to me that anyone look at me as such. But on the other hand, it, it gave me, you know, the opportunities kept growing and, and it's something I love. And gradually I became, I'm still nervous in front of people when I sing. I mean, I just still am. But began to really appreciate and love these small, really small events where I could share Kirtan with people and um, awesome. And then came really the main my life. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. what was the main thing of my spiritual life? And it became the main thing of my public life. Yeah, that, I, that was something, you touched on something exactly I was curious about because it was kind of Daniel Paul who mentioned, you know, Kirtan was really just your personal devotional practice. And then like you said, that time when, you know, Pagan Love, of Love Orchestra kind of went on hold and then you started getting these calls for, you know, this unexpected type of performance. And was that like artistically challenging? Like, did you have conflict of like, I don't even know if I, I understand you were shy with your voice, which by the way, as someone who sees you, like, I would never know this. This is kind of what's fun about having a conversation. But were you like, in, in an artistic alignment, like I want to share Kirtan with people at these type of, you know, small concerts, or was that something you kind of had to grow into as well? No, uh, artistically, I was there. I mean, I, I mean, when I say there, I'm not, I'm not saying artistically I was great or something, but artistically I was comfortable because I had been doing this in my home really since I even before I went to India, you know, I was 17 or something. Mm. So singing kirtan with a harmonium and leading kirtan with a small group not on stage but just in in private and you know i was very comfortable on an artistic level and i always approached kirtan very creatively music wise you know like in especially with, you know with daniel uh, often he would turn to me in the middle of the kirtan and said okay make make up a new melody now just make something up hmm. and so i kind of 
And I have to thank Daniel for that whole concept. You're making up a, a melody in front of people. Hmm. But, but, but that became sort of, you know, a big part of the joy of, of sharing kirtan was also, it was a completely creative pra- uh, practice. I, I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have all the supporting orchestration and sounds, but at that point, I was actually happy to simplify musically. Mm-hmm. But psychologically, it was a big challenge. As just I was saying, you know, I, I would sometimes be very terrified before. Well, I, with the pagans, I would go through that, but I was also drinking and stuff, and and you know, doing whatever I could to kind of subjugate my fear, which, by the way doesn't work it works for a minute but but all those all of that stuff gets put into a room inside of your soul and finally that room gets so crowded it has to explode and then wow so but i didn't realize that at the time but but so with the kirtan i you know i I did find that after the first song or something then i then i felt comfortable and but you know technically it was already very comfortable for me. Hmm. I think that's one of the things that, you know, I most appreciate about your artistry is, is you bring your creative um, energy and insight and musicality into Kirtan. And it's still allowed to be Kirtan. It's still something that people can sing to. I, I, I see how, you know, Pagan Love Orchestra, that was experimental, improvisatory, inspired by all kinds of musical traditions. And even though the kirtan is such a smaller ensemble and kirtan by its nature is meant to be, you know, more simple, um, I still hear such a rich musicality. And so um, it's just been really cool to kind of speak with you from that progression, um, really affirm um, something special that you've brought to the world of kirtan. Thank you. Thank you for saying it. Uh, You know, when you listen to Indian well, in India, there's so many kind of different, so many different kinds of kirtan, and and in the villages, the melodies and the yeah, and the melodies are are usually very simple and, and repetitive. But what you hear in the villages is an incredible groove. Yeah. You know, it, it's more groove than any of the funkiest rock soul music ever heard. <laughs> you know, the the dola players or the madanga players and the cymbals and but, but the melodies are, are usually very simple and the singers are, are rough, you know, untrained, rustic. But there's also this whole tradition in the cl- of classical singers, or maybe we'd say light classical singers, I guess, in, in India, doing kirtan with, with magnificent voices and, and very complex melodies. This, you know, it, it's for a different audience. It's for a more sophisticated. And when I say sophisticated, I don't mean better or worse. I mean, just like yeah, more, more sophisticated audience. Mm. It's been so wonderful speaking with you, Jai. I, I just never would have guessed that you're somebody who was shy with your voice and that it was raga music that brought out that voice. And, and now here we are in a global pandemic and you sing by yourself from your living room every week and uh i think it's it's a fascinating story of the life of a musician um from your young hippie days to releasing an album that gained uh international recognition and here we are today you're still uh sharing this music and um you know for our listeners what what is the best way for them to find um access to your live streams to your work to stay connected with you in these times well, the, the best is my website, jayutal.com. You know, I'm on, I'm on uh, Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and, and an, another platform you might know of called Patreon. Yes. Uh, which I share. Uh, uh, Patreon is, is like based on the ancient system of patronage where people pledge a certain amount of money to me every month. Usually, usually it's a dollar, you know. It's, it's a, I'm, I, 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 I've tried to keep it very low, and you know. But then, so then over the course of each month, I, I, I post unique videos and all kinds of stuff. But my website has it all, you know, and the, the live streams come from a different link, but, but that link is on my website. You know, the, the live streams, I play harmonium, I play guitar, I play banjo, and, and we're, you know, we've also been doing our online kirtan camps. But all the information is, is on my website. I do want to mention something before we close, which is bringing me so much joy. Um, my son is 15. 
and he's a passionate, passionate musician. Mm. He plays keyboards. He doesn't sing, I want to say, yet. Uh, and he might not, but I got a feeling the voice is going to burst out after a while. But he plays beautiful. He's, uh, you know, he's into 60s and 70s rock. Like his favorite right now is Allman Brothers and uh, Leon Russell. And what a joy it is to hear him playing and practicing and you know, jamming. He's got a band. They've been together since fifth grade. Wow. Right now, one of the mothers of one of his bandmates tested positive for COVID. So, so they're temporarily on hold. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's awesome, you know? Wow. And I never pushed. Uh, we, I always felt, my God, you know, he, well, he, would st- he was interested in music and he started piano when he was quite young, but he never practiced, you know, and, I, and I, it was always a push and pull for me. Should I push him or should I not? And I decided he has, is having so much fun with it, as is, that I wouldn't push it. And now he's just uh, playing and playing and playing, and playing. I love that. <laughs> it's beautiful to share the, you know, it's such a weird time, but the joy of, you know, family and, and having that experience as a father and parent, um, it's clear to me that it just brings you so much love and joy. And um, yeah, I'm glad that you, you shared that. It's just something to be positive about is um, our family and our loved ones and the people um, in our lives, you know, whether yeah. they're in our home or we have to you know, FaceTime them or whatever, but it sounds like this is keeping you inspired and positive through these kind of weird times. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. Well, first of all, I feel very lucky with with our family, my wife and my son, you know, of course we have our moments, you know, who doesn't, but we're really, really, really a strong love team. Mm-hmm. But I want to encourage everyone, including myself, because I, I, I slack off on this, but it's so important for us to reach out to our, our friends and our loved ones um, over phone or Zoom or whatever, you know, and and, st- and keep the connections going. You know, it's easy to get lazy about that and you know, feel a little down about being isolated, but the way to not be isolated is to stay connected. And that was one of the impetuses, impetuses the word? Um, for the live stream concerts because they're, you know, they're not, not a financial, we charge a little, we charge eleven dollars, and sometimes we have fifteen people, and we pay thirty percent to our our other, you know, the tech person. So, so it's not like it's a money maker. Although there have been times when we've had two hundred people, which was like really cool. Yeah, but it's more about the spirit of staying connected, and I find it so important. It's also helped me because I I plan what I'm going to say, and I focus, and I makes me, you know, I practice. Because when there's no ever performance or ever playing or recording, it's easy to also forget about practicing, you know? Yeah. So the concerts have also helped me focus and keep creating. But really, the essence of it has been to stay connected and keep the connection with people going. Well, I um, commend you for, for being that example and reminder through your live streams and music and sharing that bit of wisdom for us all as we're, we're all going through this, no matter where we are in the world. So yeah, it's just been such a pleasure connecting with you, Jai, and uh, speaking about your life and your music. Just stay well. And, and friends, um, if you're curious about joining Jai in his live streams, visit his website, jaiutal.com. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thanks again, Jai. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Will. It's been a really, really pleasure for me too to get to know you and talk with you a little bit. Well, thank you so much for your support of the World Music Podcast. I want to take a quick moment and mention how you can find my other offerings in addition to this show. The best place to do that is via my website, willmarshmusic.com, where you'll find links to my own original music, my teaching resources, my instrument shop, and my blog where I do written transcriptions of these interviews. And once again, all of that can be found on my website, willmarshmusic.com. Thanks again. See you on the next episode.